I woke up this morning and saw a message from my friend telling me to watch this video, Western Woman Brainwashed in Mainland China. It's about the Chinese education system and I figured as a teacher in China, I've got some things I'd like to say about it. So let's get straight into watching it. Faced with the choice of raising my daughter in mainland China or the USA, I knew which was the right choice. You see, China does have a very robust education system, but unfortunately it comes along with a huge amount of brainwashing. And I thought, what better way to discuss this than to speak to a Western woman who grew up and went to school in mainland China. Uh, you know, the red dragon is going to do what the red dragon wants to do. And, and Oh boy. Okay. So three words into it and I've already got something to say. Using language like the red dragon is revealing and you should watch out for it when you're listening to any sort of content that's political or critical of government or system or anything in that regard because there's a history language has a history and language like that have been used time and time again normally during wartime to dehumanize the enemy for example the one everyone will recognize as world war ii the reference to germans as jerry's right when you dehumanize the enemy it's easier for you to vilify them it's easier for you to say bad things about them and it's easier to for you to do nasty things to them so language like the red dragon is revealing of a bias so we know i mean aside from the title western woman brainwashed we know already that um this this video has a very strong angle that it's trying to hit simultaneously language like jerry and gook which was used in vietnam is used to brainwash people too so it kind of implies that she's also received a bit of brainwashing on the other side uh, by way of uh, you know, having these sorts of names for things like, I don't even know, is it the Chinese party? Is it China as a whole? Is it the Chinese people? I'm unsure. But, geez, 30 seconds in. Having grown up in China, I, you know, was, I spent 18 years of my life living under CCP rule as a child, as a foreigner. Now, I mean, yeah. me personally, I, I lived in China for 14 and a half years. So, you know, I've been there long enough to see what's going on. I also of course, taught English and, uh, you know, taught in kindergartens, in middle schools. And then I moved on to did some high school stuff. Then I also taught uh, adults and uh, business English and stuff and eventually moved on to teaching doctors. OK, teaching doctors English. That's an important distinction because he just said, I've seen the whole education system while leaving out massive facets of it. So education in China can be broken down into uh, three main industries, so to speak. You have public education, which is free for everyone, providing you have your huko. You've got private education, which is similar to public, except you pay for it. What does that mean? Well, it's still beholden to all of the laws and rules around curriculum and teaching in China, except uh, unlike a public school, the money goes to the private school board, I guess, the people who fund it, and in exchange, they get a bit more freedoms. So things like controlling your schedule and controlling your class size and and who enrolls in your school and, and things of that effect. Lastly, there's international schools. This is for people who have only for people who have a foreign passport and they're not beholden to anything as far as I'm aware. Uh, the reason why I bring this up is because he's talk, talked about kindergartens and public schools, a little bit of high, uh, uh, middle schools, a bit of high school, and then training centers for, for adults. This is hardly a thorough repertoire of ex educational experience in China. I'm not saying it's a little. He's done a lot, sure. But when he says, I've basically experienced the whole system, no, he hasn't. And I'm curious, how... How was your education? Did you go to a public school or were you in like international private schools? Well, yeah, I was in, in the international circuit, obviously starting out because my Chinese, my level of Mandarin was zero going in, you know, so I couldn't go to a public school because I would have failed on the premise mm. of purely not understanding anything. 
Right. So um, I went to an international kindergarten, um, and then until my Chinese level was sufficient. And then uh, I went to a Chinese public school for a year, but because I was so traumatized from the... Okay, so we have to clear a few things up. Why did they just spend a minute or two, um, a minute, maybe 30 seconds of the video talking about their experience? It's because uh, it's a logically fallible way to bolster your argument. Uh, the fallacy is called appeal to experience, and what it means is you're saying... Instead of presenting a logical argument or, or facts and information that prove your point, you say, well, actually, because I'm so experienced, you just take what I say for to be the truth. And that's what we're going to see happen here. And the reason why it's interesting is because, as you just heard her say, actually, she only went to public school for a year. And she's going to say this again later. So now we've got the language they use, the fallacy that's the foundation of their argument, clickbait titles like Western Woman Brainwashed, when actually they're referencing her one year in eighth grade, I believe. Uh, hopeful, I mean, if by now you haven't seen that this isn't a thoroughly thought out video, then uh, let's continue and you can find out. The experience, having gone from an American school, which is pretty much you know, the equivalent of any school you'd find in the U.S., it's sort of the way that I'm not talking about standards and stuff, because, you know, obviously yeah. there is a difference between private and public and even in states. But the way that they teach you, they teach you to be a critical thinker. OK, she brought it up and Winston earlier as using American education as an example and also to further the point about against her experience in public in public schools in China she's just said it's basically like any American school you would go to her international school experience in China is equivalent of any standard US school all right and that's what international schools are they're not beholden to government regulations they typically do uh, British A series or American curriculums and more often lately IB curriculums. So they're it's like being educated in another country essentially. You can challenge a teacher. Yeah. You can debate with a teacher. Mm. In the Chinese school system, you say, uh, yes, Lao Shu. No Lao Shu. Yeah. How high do you want me to jump, Lao Shu? You know, there's no Okay, so is public school in China like that? Yes. It is very yes, Lao Shu, and no Lao Shu. That means teacher, by the way, because, uh, well, let me tell you why. <laughs> because 1.3 billion people, right? Public school in China is free. They have the world's largest population. There's a lot of students who need to get educated. What does this result in? It's a system where public schools are crammed with people. You have 40 people in a classroom and a 45-minute lesson. So if you get into an argument with your teacher or if you debate something with your teacher or a fellow student, what that means is you're eating up everybody's time to learn the content, okay? So 45-minute lessons, 40 students, that's less. That, that's a, just over a minute per average, for each student to interact with the teacher and a little bit of change. So all that time you're soaking up debating, the teacher's not able to respond to other students or finish presenting and teaching the content they have to. China, China examination systems are heavily focused on information requisition, on memorizing, basically. You have a large examination at the end of your year and you have, you've got to recall everything. And the, the, that's got to do with the competitive nature of having so many students in China and limited spots in the good universities, right? And so these teachers who have 45 minutes and 40 students per lesson not only have such a limited amount of time available to them, but further, they've got so much information they've got to get through. So yes... Yes, teacher, no teacher, stand up to say your answer, sit down again. That's how it's done. It's a very old approach to education, and it's got a time and place, to be fair. It's, but, uh, you know, that's that's the context when, when she says that. Furthermore, this issue is addressed by private schools in China who are still beholden to the same government regulations as far as curriculum go, but have more freedom in the way they structure their classes. So we don't have this issue if you are in a private school. Uh, so that's important to know when she says things like this. It's like a robot. They beat creativity out of you. 
Yeah. They beat independent thinking and critical action. No, they don't beat it out of you. It's a result of the context, as I just said. This isn't students being brainwashed. This is how do we most effectively get as many people as possible the information we want them to know. If you want to be creative, there's so many avenues for you to pursue creativity outside of school. It's not done that often or more often than not it's forced on them through the way of music lessons and so have you but the point is these avenues exist they're just not a priority in a school they're just not a priority in a school setting where you have the previous mentioned variables because we have to prioritize the exam also again well addressed in private education in china absolutely as a private education teacher, we encourage our students, Chinese students, to be independent thinkers and creative all the time. I mean, it's almost the top priority we have. Analysis out of you. Yeah, that's you are true. Not, you're not allowed to be a nonconformist. You're praised for being a yes man and for bowing down to the system. And if it was a good system, I would not condone that, but I would still say... Okay, the system. If it was a good system. In other words, the system's bad. What system specifically? Because the system I know has alleviated, lifted more people out of poverty in the last 30 years at a, a rate faster than we've ever seen in history. The city I know is, the, 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 the system I'm familiar with is responsible for economic growth unparalleled, right? So if it was a good system, and know that, yes, of course they're allowed to be non-conformist, Granted, the exception is don't criticize the government, but w everything else is fine <laughs> as long as you're not threatening the stability, right? And so this is, a, this is an interesting statement, especially in context of the comparison, which is America. Because when she says if it was a good system, she's not talking about the schools or anything. What she's actually talking about is all of the peripheral stuff that happens, that, the, the human right um violations right the, the situation in xinjiang or tibet or hong kong and i don't defend that and i don't I, I have opinions on them that i haven't shared on the channel but that's besides the point because even if we take them to be true well the comparison's america when america's your comparison you lose all strength in your argument you should have picked like i don't know canada or someone because what how when when <laughs> when's the third bush bush junior the second gonna come in to make more lies up about the middle east to invade them again right like how many uh, millions more civilians will die in the next american war that uh, b was entirely built on premises that aren't true so you know sure your students can be critical independent thinkers because they've got the privilege of a smaller a, a smaller population size and 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 what have you so so teachers can spend time with students at what cost not your liberty the liberty of everybody else that america fiddles with. so this is uh, this is probably one of the things that has annoyed me the most about this video good system jeez okay i can understand the rationale because most people are sheep i call them sheeple you yeah. know people who conform and people who you know usually got the nine to five and overextended mortgage and they don't think for themselves they absorb whatever shit is on tv on the news without questioning those are sheeple and the chinese communist system rewards you for being a sheep yeah okay how does the chinese communist system reward people for being sheep this is why that appeal to experience is important because they don't actually tell you how or why they just tell you it is and why must you listen to them because well she spent 18 years under their control right and as we've already seen it's actually one year in public school but i don't know i can guess what they're meaning is things like the chinese social credit system right which exists in america again in the form of their credit score too it's about things like being a financially responsible citizen and meeting your payment obligations. Are you late for rent? Did you make your, your debt repayment? Things that effect, right? Uh, Simon Yu's got a great video on it. I'll link it right now if you want to watch it. It really goes it, he, he, where he talks. He's, he shares his social credit with you. So I suggest you watch that video. And I couldn't, I couldn't adjust. Yeah. So, uh, you know, my parents took me out and, um, and I finished my schooling in, in the international school system. Good. But even so, 
the international school system in China is interesting because they charge you astronomical fees to, you know, there's a lot of Chinese students who get in, put into that system if their parents can afford it because they want, would like to go. It's a passage into a U.S. college. They do the PSAT, the SAT, whereas in Chinese schools, you'd be very hard pressed to find a child who's gone through the public system in China and then, you know, with his Chinese diploma is able to get admission into U.S. college because the systems are not compatible. Okay, geez, where to begin? So, uh, again, international schools only for foreign passport holders. Yes, many Chinese go to international schools. Yes, they're expensive. That's a result of the privatization of the education system. What do you expect? But as for those Chinese people going there, they have foreign passports. They were born overseas, more often than not deliberately, so that their parents could send them to an international school in China because they have the money to. The alternative is to send them to America or to New Zealand or to Australia to do their teaching there. And no parent obviously wants to be away from their children. So yeah, this happens often and international students are mostly student, Chinese students who also hold a second passport that's not recognized by the government. Um, what she just said about the Gaokao system is a lie. It's empirically untrue. Gaokao is recognized by many universities around the world, top universities as well, like the University of Birmingham. Furthermore, at this point in time, current climate, no Chinese want to go to US universities anyway. Thank you, Trump, right? So the situation is that uh, at the moment, the vast majority of applications, at least the applications I've worked on are targeted at British universities. So uh, that's just not true. Things are not compatible. So, it, you know, because the majority of kids who had gone to those schools and the school was still partially owned by China, because there's always a monopoly on it, whether it's private or public, mm. they did teach us a completely incorrect fabricated version of history, for example. Okay. So I don't know if this is still true and I'm not sure. I actually, I don't know if this applies to schools, but as of a few years ago, three years ago, there are things called WAFIs, wholly owned foreign enterprises. I own one with my business partner, Marvin, in um, beauty production and consultation. Yeah, makeup and stuff, whatever. Uh, point is... Wholly owned foreign enterprises don't need a local investor. I'm not sure if international schools qualify under that uh, category, though. Okay. So can you give me an example of the fabricated history they would teach you? Oh, yeah. Uh, they were telling us that um, um, Mao Zedong, you know, mm -hmm. um, decided to... Uh, how did they put this? Let me just try to think back. This is on eighth grade. Right. Oh, yeah. Uh, he traveled he, he had traveled to America at the time, mm -hmm. and he had realized that America was evil. Okay. And that is why, yeah, yeah, America was evil. And I mean, America is evil. Are we arguing this? Hi, <laughs> Warren, as you call it. Well, they're evil. They're evil people. Uh, they... China is the real, uh, the, the real freedom is to be found in, within the Chinese system. Okay, so what she's saying is that her revised history that she was brainwashed with as Mao went to America and was like, wow, America sucks. Well, here's, I mean, that's obviously not word for word, whatever. Um, now, he didn't go to America, not to my knowledge. He did go to the Soviet Union, but not America. Um, but the rest of it, is not far from the truth. Mao was heavily critical publicly of America. That's all on record. If he didn't say these exact word things verbatim, he probably said things very close to it. So when your teacher is teaching you, hey, Mao said these things, that's not brainwashing. That's just teaching you what Mao said. That is, uh, you know, only to be found, that is all false. You know, mm. the West, the Western people are slaves to their government. The Chinese system, mm -hmm. you know, is the only system that allows freedom. So we were completely brainwashed. Right. You know, they, we were told that the guy who broke away from mainland to set up uh, in Taiwan, yeah. uh, we were told that he was a traitor and a spy that the CIA had implanted, <laughs> you know, into China and that the whole of Taiwan was overrun with CIA. Okay, so the thing is, um, they, Sun Yat Sen? Was it Sun Yat Sen? 
they were they were heavily backed by America. This again is also public record. It was Russia backing Mao and the communists, and America backing the Kuomintang as the exact you know basically anything as long as it's not communism, right? So again, not false. Uh, how many CIA agents are in Taiwan or were in Taiwan? I don't know. At least one. Sure. Um, yeah, brainwashing. Ooh. Obviously gone on to study stateside. Mm -hmm. I'd, been, I'd lived stateside. I did my undergrad, postgrad. And of course, people would be talking to me about, you know, where I'm from and stuff. And I would start telling them, oh, you know, the Chinese society, you know, is like this and that. And they were like, what? You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> they, <laughs> they were like, what the hell is she talking about? Wow. You yeah. know, the I'm not entirely sure either. I honestly don't know what her point is. Taiwan isn't overrun by CIA agents and, you know, like what? Here's the other thing. No school in their right mind is going to teach children that Taiwan is overrun and controlled by CIA agents, CIA agents because what that means is that the China, one China, two party system isn't working and that it gives legitimacy to Taiwan being separate. And the Communist Party would never say that. Uh, subsequently, I'm pretty confident this is BS. Uh, I've also checked with my partner and other local friends of mine who they say they were never taught this. Um, they went to school from the 90s. And it's definitely not true as today's public education system in China. What the hell is she? So at the end of the day, I had to relearn because I'd been taught lies from yeah. the age of four through to the age of 18 in terms of... I guess so you were either relearning some minor misnomers about the nature of how many CIA agents are in Taiwan and whether or not Mao went to America, if what you're saying is true, but then at least you're not relearning history about things like Robert E. Lee or Christopher Columbus, you're not pledging allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. So again, if America is your comparison, if China's so full of brainwashing and America are uh, the, the liberators or the better alternative, well, again, I mean, you should have chosen Canada or something because really poor comparison. Yeah, that's terrible. My entire understanding of the world is warped. Yeah, because and that, that's a that... crime against humanity, actually. Uh, the Chinese government closing off the Western media. So they block the internet, you know, they don't allow any Western mm -hmm. news to get in there. So when you grow up and you hear this stuff and you never have anyone challenge that, you just take it as truth. Mm -hmm. So actually some good points made here. Now, I want to make a clear distinction between what censorship is and what uh, brainwashing is. Brainwashing is making people believe something that isn't true or is different to what's established elsewhere, whereas censorship is just the emittance of information. Chinese schools are heavily censored, as is Chinese media and Chinese internet, so they don't get access to things that might show them another perspective. This is true. It's one of my biggest frustrations with living and teaching here. Um, this is not brainwashing, however, it does have, it's a, what it is, is omittance. They omit history much more frequently than they change it. That is for sure. For example, current curriculum mostly just ignores Mao. It's just not really a focus of what they teach anymore. Um, my girlfriend's always told me how she was taught that, you know, Mao did some good things and then and towards the end of his life he made some really bad mistakes. So, and that's, depending on who you talk to, almost a fair analysis of, of, of Mao's lifetime. So, again, it's not about brainwashing. Censorship isn't about brainwashing, it's mostly about omittance. I mean, look, I, I left China for that specific reason because they were targeting my family, you know, they were, uh, constantly harassing me online. They were harassing my parents in South Africa, even, you know, trying to, uh, they were sending wow. them emails. They, they contacted all the businesses uh, in the area where my parents live because my parents have a public uh, business, you know, so it's easy to find them by searching their names. So they contacted all the businesses in the area and were sending them emails saying that my parents are racist and, uh, you know, their son is a, a criminal in China and a spy and all this crap, you know. And so, my parents like 
friends who run a pizza shop or whatever be like, what's going on? Why are we getting all these messages saying that you guys are? Yeah, and that's horrible. Um, I do feel for him in that regard. He's he's had some pretty serious threats laid against him and attempted actions and whatnot. Having said that, I mean, you're kind of deliberately poking the beehive, aren't you, with a lot of the clickbait titles and then the sweeping generalizations you make in your posts. So, I mean, you knew what you were getting into. That's how you monetized your channel, right? I don't like that. I don't like that as a defense or as a criticism laid against someone because having watched his channel from, what, 2015, it's... It's clear to me how he's gone out of his way to monetize himself, which is fine. Fair dinkums. You've done well cultivating this audience and monetizing the hate that's laid against you. But it really seems like you've deliberately stoked those flames. Or X, Y, Z, you know, and they, they even sent emails to the EFF and the ANC to say my parents are like... Uh, racists and their son is a racist in china and a, a spy they've tried all these tricks you know um and it would usually work on a chinese citizen because they get in, intimidated and they shut up but uh right i mean my experience now to let's appeal to my experience with my own logical fallacy um the average chinese person just doesn't care enough to bother with all of that you're dealing with a very niche group of ultra-nationalistic nas people, um, but that is definitely not the typical person you'll, you'll encounter. More often than not, you'll meet them and they'll be like, I just, I just don't want to talk about this, let's change the topic. That's much more common response you'll get. Yeah, that didn't work on me, unfortunately. It just made me angrier, <laughs> you know? Yes. Crazy stuff. It, that is insane, but you know what? I wouldn't put it past him. And I think what happened with you is that it takes a specific sort of alpha personality type, whether that's an alpha male or alpha female, mm -hmm. which I think both of us have uh, a majority of those traits. Yeah. Whereas when you push a person in a certain direction, they can go one of two ways. They can either secede or they can fight back. And that's some the, the pseudo psychology fight back bullshit. Are up against an enormous, insurmountable odds whether it's manipulation, intimidation, threats, these people will stop at absolutely nothing to, you know, suppress the truth of what is going on in China and how they're, you know, dealing with their own citizens. And China has a lot of influence in the Western sphere. They own almost half of Australia. They have a significant... They own half of Australia, almost half. You mean the land? You mean the politicians? You mean the trade? Ooh. Are you listening to yourself? I don't think that, you know, we need to cut China off at the root. And, you know, yeah. cutting them off where it hurts means cutting off their access to Western businesses, to Western mm -hmm. supplies, and, and, and cutting off their, their easy access to immigration, especially to the States. You know. I agree with you. I'm struggling to follow this argument. The Communist Party brainwash their own people into being subordinate. Therefore, we need to cut off their access to the world through business and trade. So that what what what's your goal? I can't. Um... Whereas any any Chinese citizen can come to the U.S. or Australia and marry someone or at least, you know, invest or do something. And a couple of years down the line, they have their citizenship and all the rights. But China doesn't offer the same back to anyone. So you, I'm, I have, I'm a South African citizen and I'm a permanent resident of New Zealand, not a citizen. Permanent residency, however, grants me all of the rights of New Zealand while I'm in New Zealand. So you don't need to become a citizen to get those rights. And there are avenues to that in China. Um, and foreigners are actually pretty well protected by the law in China too. China is a communist country. You must remember that they've got an excellent labor law. I know I'm currently dealing with issues myself going through all of that, which has been a headache I'll share with you in a few months. <laughs> Regardless, the point is um, it's definitely possible. It's very hard, yes, but it's not required 
in order to receive those rights you're after, that's also key information. I'm saying the majority, uh, and uh, you know, obviously there are tons of exceptions to this rule, but from my experiences, even though they have an Australian citizenship or a Canadian citizenship or an American citizenship, they see it as a tool rather than you know a new life. They still maintain their Chinese identity and their loyalty to the CCP above all else. So first and foremost, thank you for acknowledging the large amount of exceptions to that generalization. Secondly, when that when does that change? When those people have children, you will not find an American-born Ch Chinese or a New Zealand-born Chinese or English-born Chinese who are that loyal to the party like their parents are. Thirdly, of course they maintain their Chinese identity. They're Chinese. Citizenship doesn't matter. I left when at South Africa when I was ten, and I still maintain my South African identity. This is who I am. It's what I. It's formed a lot of my beliefs and my cultures, and it's shaped my experiences and and developed me into the person I am today. So. I don't just because you immigrate doesn't mean you you give up your identity as a person of a uh, from a, another nationality that's that's absurd. I wouldn't want Chinese people to immigrate to my country and give up their identity. They should still continue being Chinese whether they're in New Zealand or South Africa or America or what have you just as I continue to be South African wherever I go. So I, I that's a strange argument to make from my perspective. So, quick 1 minute summary. This video says China brainwashes their students into loving the party while simultaneously holding America to the standard that they should be measuring themselves again. Well, let's do that. Chinese are taught to love the party. Yes, it's true. But Americans pledge allegiance to the flag. Chinese revise some of their history. Apparently, I don't believe it though. And, and the way they tell you Mao into America when he didn't, well, uh, America whitewashes history and 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 praises historical racists like Robert E. Lee and Christopher Columbus who committed horrible things. So yes, there are some issues with Chinese education and brainwashing, but it's not to the degree they say. Uh, censorship's a larger issue, and the Americans are equally as guilty, which is their gold standard. Should have, should have, should have talked about the Canadians or something. Although apparently they've got evils as skeletons in the closet too. So this is a part of a larger trend with this person's videos. As they seem to run out of content and ideas to discuss, they keep stretching for more and more. I'm going to do a video soon from the same guy about birds in China. Because for me that's been the most absurd example. That's the crickets, never mind. If I was filming three hours earlier instead of crickets, you'd be hearing all the birds on the trees outside. And I live in the middle of Shanghai, 24 million people, giant as a uh, metropolitan area, buildings all over me, right? So that's probably gonna be coming up soon. Hey team, I've got a whole bunch of new subscribers to everybody coming over from the Barrett channel. Thank you, it's really encouraging. Uh, you've all left such positive and encouraging comments on my videos, I feel really good about that. Uh, it just as validation for the work I put in, so I appreciate it hugely. Um, I really appreciate your support. I'll be making a lot more videos. I'm going to be continuing with the education theme over the next few weeks. I just got back from Yunnan. That's why I haven't posted a video in a while. And I'm currently working on my Yunnan, Yunnan video. It's not uh, epic travel like I've done historically. It's going to be a bit more casual. But it's just taking a bit longer to make. So that'll be coming up as well as a whole bunch more content team. So if you enjoyed this, if you want to hear more, uh, I'll, be, I'll be sharing a lot. So make sure to... Give, give us a subscribe, like the video if you enjoyed it, and leave a comment. I really love engaging with your team. Peace. Peace. That's such a... I need... You know, I know how to start a video. I don't know how to end one. See you next time. That's so lame.